Hi, my name is Roger Little. Today we're going to talk about the ADA and office ergonomics. A brief summary of the ADA. It actually is rooted in the Rehab Act of 1973. The Rehab Act focused on the federal government. It's hiring practices for people with disabilities, the removal of physical barriers as well as electronic and information barriers. In 1990, the ADA was passed, and it extended its reach to both state and local governments, as well as all public accommodations, non-government employment, as long as the employer had 15 or more employees. And it was considered the furthest reaching civil rights legislation since the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So it's a very important piece of legislation in the American history. It also defined accessibility guidelines, and basically they were updated from the Architectural Barriers Act. In 2008, the ADA was amended because the courts were providing a very narrow interpretation of the term disability, and it also wanted to expand the eligibility of the ADA to more groups of people. So let's look at some of the basics. The crux of the ADA is the definition of a disability, and it's defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Having a record of such an impairment, or even just being regarded as having an impairment. The ADA is focused on non-discrimination. It is not affirmative action. An employee, or someone seeking a job, must be qualified and must be able to perform the essential job functions. If that person meets those qualifications, they cannot be discriminated against in the hiring of the job and they are eligible for reasonable accommodations. And we'll talk about what that means. First, let's look at the, the clause substantially limits. The ADA defines substantially limits rather loosely. With the Amendments Act, it really didn't change the definition, but the legislators made sure that the courts understood that they were not to define this in a narrow sense, but to broaden it in, in a much less stringent interpretation. Basically, they just didn't want them nitpicking over the definition of disability, and they wanted them to focus on, did a discrimination occur? Let's take a look at the case law of Toyota versus Williams. Williams was a, an assembly line worker in a Toyota plant. She worked with pneumatic tools, and she developed bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome and tendonitis. She was moved around the plant. Different accommodations were made over the next two years. Eventually, she took medical leave and filed a settlement on a workman's claim comp. When returning to work, she wasn't satisfied with the accommodations made, so she filed a suit with the ADA. The claim was settled, and she went to work as a quality control position. Here, she had to visually inspect cars, wipe them off with a glove, and she felt that these were tasks that she could do. About three years later, two additional tasks were given to her. To spread oil on the car and then to wipe it off and check for flaws. She began experiencing additional problems and therefore she stopped going to work and the doctor restricted her from any kind of work whatsoever. As a result, Toyota fired Williams and Williams then turned around and sued Toyota. Williams claimed a disability because of her physical impairment substantially limited major life activities such as housework, gardening, playing with her children, lifting, working, etc. The ADA does define a disability not only in terms of employment but also in a variety of tasks central to a person's life. However, the courts ruled that manual tasks unique to a particular job are not necessarily important parts of a person's life since she can perform other activities such as household chores, brushing her teeth, etc., Williams was not considered disabled. Another clause in the ADA it talks about major life activities. Major life activities was greatly expanded in the amendments. A number of major life activities were specifically stated, such as caring for oneself, sleeping, walking, standing, learning, etc. 
the amendments, it specifically says that this is not an all-inclusive list. The other major area that the Amendments Act talked about was major bodily functions, such as the immune system, the respiratory system, reproductive functions, etc. And those are specifically listed in there. Let's take a look at a case law that deals with major life activity. Here's an electrician. He had muscular dystrophy since he was 15 years old. So he performs his job that he has to do overhead by repositioning himself or using stability. So he's essentially adapted his job for his abilities. He has 20 years experience as an electrician and he applied to General Motors. General Motors said, okay, we'll hire you, but you need to take a pre-employment physical. During that time, the doctors asked him to raise his hands over his head and he couldn't do it. However, he explained how he accommodated himself throughout his work. Nonetheless, GM withdrew the employment offer. However, the courts ruled that since he had adapted to a, a way of life, he really didn't have a disability that substantially limited a major life activity, and therefore he was not covered under the ADA. Again, these are case laws that occurred under the ADA, which is reason why the Amendments Act was enacted. Another clause in the ADA is something called mitigating measures, and basically it could be any medication or device that when taken to account would lessen the person's limitation in some major life activity, and therefore, if the person can be helped enough, they would not be considered disabled. In the Amendments Act, it specifically stated that any beneficial effects of mitigating measures cannot be considered when determining a disability. So if a person is missing a leg, but they have a prosthetic, and they can walk around with their prosthetic, they're still considered disabled. One exception the Amendments Act does make is for eyeglasses and contacts. Let's take a look at a case law under the ADA for mitigating measures. Consider a pharmacist. He was hired, and he needed to take a 30-minute break on a 10-hour shift to attend to his diabetes. Manager said fine. All they did was close the pharmacy during that time. When a new manager took over, he didn't allow that break. He said that you could just eat during slow times and you couldn't necessarily close the window at a specific time. Although the worker complied, he obviously had problems regulating his blood sugar and he asked for a, a 30 minute break. The employer ended up firing this employee. However, when the courts looked at it, they said that he really wasn't disabled because his diabetic medication helped him control his disability and therefore he wasn't covered under the ADA. When considering episodic conditions, some lower courts held that individuals must be limited in more than one major life activity in order to be considered disabled. Other courts said that episodic conditions or intermittent impairments such as epilepsy or post-traumatic stress disorder were not even counted under the law. The Amendments Act made it very clear an individual that was limited in one major life activity, one was enough. Also, the Amendments Act specifically stated that episodic conditions are included. There is a clause in there that says if the person is regarded as having a disability. And that was put in there to help eliminate false perceptions and fears and being discriminatory based on improper information. Once the court started interpreting the ADA, some of the rulings were coming out stating that if an individual was regarded as having an impairment, it had to affect a major life activity. When the Amendments Act was written, they specifically stated that regarded as does not apply to conditions that are transitory or six months or less or that are minor. They also stated that there was no obligation on the employer's part to make a reasonable accommodation for a person who is solely regarded as. In other words, they haven't declared themselves as needing an accommodation or a person with a disability, so therefore an employer isn't obligated to try to provide one. And I always think that this particular area is a little bit hard to understand. So here's a couple of examples. If an employer decides not to put a cosmetically disfigured person in a customer service position, 
then that employer has regarded that person as having a disability for that job. Another example might be if an employee following a brain surgery for a, a tumor being removed is demoted by his boss because the boss does not feel that he can handle the stress or the fast pacedness of the job, then that person would then be regarded as having a disability and therefore is now protected under the ADA. Reasonable accommodations is something that comes up a lot when you talk about the ADA. A reasonable accommodation is any change in the employee's work environment or in the way things are usually done that results in an equal employment opportunity for an individual with a disability. One important note is the person who decides whether accommodation is reasonable is the employer. And if the employee is not happy with what the employer decides, then they can take additional measures. Also, the accommodation doesn't have to be the best accommodation or the preferred accommodation, but it does have to be effective. I included some of the major resources if you want to look up more information on the ADA. Let's turn our attention to office ergonomics. In particular, we'll look at seating, monitors, keyboard trays, pointing devices, lighting, noise, the work envelope, and special laptop considerations. Let's start with seating. The sitting posture requires less muscle work than for standing. It's also easier to work oftentimes while in a seated position. And sitting stabilizes our postures. So why could that be bad? Well, oftentimes when we sit, we tend to sit in unsupported or a slumped position. And this can greatly increase our disc pressure. Furthermore, if you tend to lean forward while being seated, that can greatly increase your disc pressure up to 85%. If you notice this picture here on the right, this first spine is while the man is standing and you see a nice S curve to the spine. However, when he assumes a seated position, that lumbar area is greatly flattened out and that can cause an increased disc pressure. Additionally, sitting in static postures for a prolonged period of time will often lead us to move to awkward, unsupported, and unstable positions. Most office workers spend a majority of their day working with their backs unsupported. Unsupported seating can lead to slumping and leaning forward. When slumping, we tend to thrust our neck forward. As we saw before, the lumbar region flattens and we have a closed angle around the knee. When we're seated but don't have support, we tend to lean forward. Our pelvis tends to tilt backwards. Again, our spine flattens out. And another important aspect is that our support shifts from our muscles to our posterior ligaments and tissues. Unsupported seating definitely leads to forward leaning. And as we already looked at, that tends to flatten the spine and increase the disc pressure. It also will tend to shift the postural support from the muscles to the ligaments. A contributing factor to leaning forward are the visual demands whether they're doing a lot of reading, maybe their font is particularly small, maybe they need glasses but they're not really wearing them or their prescription is outdated. These are all factors that can contribute to a person leaning forward and hence being unsupported in their seating. Additionally, if you combine forward flexion with twisting, this greatly compounds the possibility of injuries. Spinal twisting is one of those areas that you definitely want to pay attention to. If a person's spine is twisted, that's going to diminish the movement that's available in other dimensions, such as leaning forward or bending a little bit. 
the human spine is poorly adapted to twisting. Any time that the pelvis is rotated, you're putting your spine in a twisted position. One of the contributing factors to that is when people cross their legs. This puts a natural twist on the spine. When considering lumbar supports, we're talking about the chair being able to exude pressure on the lower part of our back to help reduce the intradiscular pressure of our spine. It also helps stabilize the postures. It helps to promote comfort. Obviously, lumbar supports are only going to work if they're adjusted properly. If you have a person that tends to recline back a lot in their chair and uses lumbar support, be careful because that can adversely affect the lumbar curve as well. When we think about reclining positions of the chair, there are a lot of advantages because it simultaneously reduces the load to the spine and the work that the muscles have to do. It also helps to reinstate that lumbar curve. Some of the disadvantages of a reclining position is that computer users tend to slump and so when you're slumping and reclining that exasperates that position. It will also increase the distances for all of your visual targets as well as your reaches. And as you recline backward, if you're working by extending your reaches, that's going to add an additional load to your neck, shoulders, and arms. Obviously with seating considerations we want to consider the frame. We want the chair to be able to rotate in all directions. This way our spine doesn't have to twist when we're doing work off center, we can allow the chair to do that for us. If a standard cylinder height doesn't work, some chairs are available with extended height cylinders for particularly tall people or shortened cylinders for particularly petite people. A chair should have a five point base, meaning there should be five casters that touch the ground. The casters can either be locking or you can get them for a particular floor type. They can either be suited for a hardwood floor or carpeting. The chair itself can either rock back and lock into different positions or it can glide and adjust. And again, it depends on how the chair manufacturer designed the chair. But the ability of the chair to adjust as the user moves is very important because even the best seated position is only good for a limited amount of time. We don't want to have someone in a static position all day long. So as they move and do different tasks, we want the chair to move with them and be supportive. The adjustment should be easy to do while being seated. Contour and cushioning is very important. Half of the body weight is supported by an 8% area of the ischial tuberosities. So the cushioning will help distribute the pressure over a larger area. Generally speaking, highly contoured seats can increase the pressure of the seating system. Another aspect of the seating system is the upholstery. Particularly if people work in very hot, humid areas, you want to make sure that you get breathable material. And certainly for the longevity of the chair, wear is important. And one thing that I tend to forget when I'm looking at specking out chairs is asking the people what color they want. The width of the chair is also important. As a person sits in their chair, they should not be resting their body parts against the frame, such as the armrest supports. Width is also important for getting in and out of the chair. One important aspect of that would be the armrests that are placed on the chair, which we'll talk about here in a minute. The depth of the chair can either be adjusted by moving the seat in and out or by taking the backrest and adjusting it in and out, depending again on the chair manufacturer. A chair should also have a waterfall design. And what I mean by that is this particular chair, as you can see, is pretty flat in the front. This particular chair has more of a waterfall design. And the waterfall design will allow a reduced pressure on the bottom of the thigh up toward the knee area. 
backrest angle and height is another consideration. Generally speaking, a sitting position of 90 degrees is not very relaxed. Recommended is about 100 to 110 degrees. Some chairs will come with a forward tilt mechanism, which will allow the seat to be tilted forward while doing reading and writing. This is important because if the chair tilts forward along with its backrest, the person can be supported while doing those tasks and not just keyboarding tasks. The backrest angles generally either lock in place or adjust with a tension knob and that tension knob can be adjusted according to the person's weight or force that they exude to the backrest. Lumbar supports can either be adjusted with air pressure, an adjustable pad, and sometimes just by stiffening or loosening the backrest. Headrest in general aren't considered a necessity unless a person has a particular cervical injury. When considering an ergonomics chair, they come with a lot of adjustments. It's important to train the user how to adjust and use the chair so that they can gain maximum support. I mentioned armrest a little bit earlier. If a chair is going to be fitted with armrest, consider the material. The material should not be a hard plastic and the armrests themselves should not be a fixed structure. The armrest should rest the flesh part of the forearm, not the elbow. That's particularly true if someone has rheumatoid arthritis. And there should be a small gap between the backrest and the armrest of the chair. Getting in and out of the chair is important and armrests can hinder that. So you want to make sure the armrests have width adjustments, both laterally and you want the front of the armrest to angle inward. That's considered towing in and that allows better support of the arm when you're doing tasks directly in front of you such as typing. It provides more surface area to the flesh part of your arm. Consider the length of the armrest. If they're too long it will make it difficult for the person to get close to their desk or their work area. And just a note that they're not necessarily recommended for typing. In general a person should type, allow their arms to move freely across the keyboard, and then as they tire or do other tasks, they can use their armrest at that time. Let's take a look at some visual displays. There's a few statistics here about visual display discomfort and loss of productivity. Those were more toward the CRT monitors and not necessarily the newer monitors that we have today. However, one problem that has been consistent is that monitors are a fixed focal length. And for a person to stare for a long period of time in one point will greatly tire the eyes. So it's recommended that you change your gaze and take those visual breaks throughout the day. Glare is a big concern. Glare can originate from windows or overhead lights. A simple way to reduce glare is to simply tilt the monitor slightly downward. Also, when setting up a workstation, you want to take into account where the windows are placed. The more lights and the less power that you use, the less glare that you're going to have. If all your light comes from one light source and you have to turn the light source up bright in order to see all of your tasks, you're going to get more glare than if you use a number of lights around the room. Also, visual displays, the contrast and brightness should match the surrounding. So if you have an area where there is a lot of sunlight during the day, you may need to increase that brightness and contrast. But as the person works on into the evening and the lights become lower, or if it's just an overcast rainy day, you may need to decrease that brightness and contrast. Another thing is to look around for reflective light from polished surfaces, light colored walls, or white papers. You can reduce the glare on a visual display by using anti-glare filters, hoods, or even light diffusers. So if you can diffuse the light that's coming out of the source, that will help as well. A simple thing that most people can do to make their visual experience better is simply to clean the monitor. A lighter background with darker colors helps to reduce the glare of the screen as well. 
when we look at the placement of a visual display if it's too far away the user may tend to lean forward and it will also take them longer to focus on smaller fonts or pictures that are displayed on the screen if that display is too close your eyes must work much more diligently to focus because of convergence and people may tend to tilt their head backwards while they're looking at the display and that is particularly true for people who have bifocals if a display is too high your neck will be more in extension your eye muscles will be gazing upward and our natural tendency is for our eye muscles to gaze slightly below horizontal so a person who is a hunt and peck typist or a one-handed typist the distance between looking at the keyboard and looking at the display to make sure their input is correct is greatly increased if the visual display is too low it can cause neck flexion and also it can also encourage the person to lean their body forward and as we saw that's a bad position another problem is staring at displays too long people who use a computer for long periods of time tend to have drier eyes because they tend to blink less also that fixed focal length that you stare at for long periods of time causes ocular fatigue when considering people who use bifocals trifocals or multifocal lenses realize that the nearer vision is generally at the bottom of the lenses so they may like the monitor a little bit lower to avoid neck extension there's also an increased time to shift to focus as they look at different elements around their workstation it will take them time to get those elements in focus and also a person has a smaller visual field because at any given time the bifocals or trifocals or multifocal lenses only have a sliver of field view in focus at any given time so here are some considerations possibly lower the monitor and tilt it slightly upwards obviously this can cause glare from overhead lighting so you might want to change the lighting sources to more of a desk lamp you may want to increase the chair height again just to keep that neck from getting extended you may want to increase the chair back angle this will help them to naturally look out of the lower part of the lenses you could consider increasing the seat tilt there are such a thing called computer glasses which are basically just fixed focal length that would give the computer user a complete view of the screen with everything in focus you could also if they have a very large monitor increase the monitor distance this may allow them to use a larger portion of their lens to view the screen sometimes people will get contacts with monovision meaning they get one eye set for near distance and the other eye set for far distance again this could be helpful to increase the field of view however only one eye is going to be in focus at any given time therefore reducing the overall acuity when we think about visual display placement guidelines put the display directly in front of the user generally speaking if you hold your hand straight in front of you your middle finger should basically touch the center of the screen you also want to set the monitor perpendicular to the windows if you set the monitor in front of a window there will be a contrast difference between the window and the monitor if the window is behind the user you'll get a lot more glare showing up on the computer screen reference material should be on the same plane as the monitor and I'll show you an example of that later another thing that people don't usually consider is as their seating position changes they don't always adjust the monitor this might be particularly helpful for people with limited vision to go ahead and have the monitor easily adjustable as they change their position during the day the computer monitor should have an equal intensity compared to the other elements of the room whether it be a window or task light flicker isn't nearly as important when we're dealing with the newer LCDs and LED computer monitors but in general a higher refresh rate reduces the flicker of a monitor since displays are not necessarily square a user might benefit from the display being wider vertically or horizontally 
horizontally if they're working on spreadsheets or multiple windows, vertically if they're working on a long document that they want to read multiple paragraphs. And another option is to consider multiple monitors. We've mentioned task lighting, so now let's take a quick look at it. Things that we would want to light are documents, particularly if there's inadequate contrast, if the document has very small print, poor handwriting, maybe for someone who is working in a doctor's office or just needs to read a lot of people's handwriting, task lighting can be very important. Inappropriate use of colors. If a person has visual deficits, if they happen to be getting up there in years, task lighting can be very beneficial. Again, when we're considering computers and task lighting, we want to produce an equal illumination between the monitor and the lights. This will help decrease the glare on the monitor screen. It might be helpful to provide lighting, particularly for keyboard and reference material. When picking out a lighting source, consider a diffuse light, particularly if the person is working with many glossy surfaces. Fluorescent bulbs are nice because they can come in many shapes and sizes. A long fluorescent bulb might be very beneficial for someone who's using large documents such as spreadsheets or, or large-scale drawings. Task lights can be placed on articulating arms so that they can be moved in different locations as needed. It's helpful to have intensity control on your light. As the ambient light changes in your room, you can match that intensity. Again, more lights, less intensity. When considering keyboard placement, our goal is to be neutral. We want our shoulders relaxed, elbows under the shoulders, elbows close to the side. Also, you want your elbows slightly higher than the keyboard. And as I mentioned before, you do not necessarily want to rest your forearms while you're typing. And you want to keep your wrists straight. We want to try to get to a negative keyboard tilt. In this example, this is considered a positive keyboard tilt. That would be neutral or no keyboard tilt, just a flat keyboard. And this would be a negative keyboard tilt. If the keyboard is too high, that means our hands are going to be higher than our elbows and our wrist or palms tend to rest on the keyboard or the edge of the desk. It will also increase the force on our shoulders. However, one finger typist or hunt and peck typist may prefer a higher positively tilted keyboard just because of their increased visual demands by looking at the keyboard and then up at the screen. If our keyboard placement is too low, we end up in wrist extension, especially with a positively tilted keyboard like you see here. Also, if the keyboard is too low for non-touch typing, it will increase the time to refocus and relocate keys once you look up at the monitor. If the keyboard placement is too close, you're going to get extreme elbow angles. It's also going to increase the difficulty looking at the keys. If your keyboard is too far away, you will tend to lean forward. You will also use up workspace by resting your arms on the table. A standard keyboard is asymmetrical by design. In general, you want to keep the B aligned with your belly button. And if you do that with a standard keyboard, that pushes the navigation keys and the number pad further to the right, which in turn also pushes the mouse further to the right. This is considered more of an ideal typing position where your elbows are beneath your shoulders and your wrists are straight. You can see the negative keyboard tilt there in the picture. A lot of times we'll see keyboard trays being used. If you do use a keyboard tray, think about space for both keyboard and pointing device. Also, if a person is using a lap drawer, there may not be enough leg room, so you may have to remove that lap drawer in order to mount the keyboard tray. If you're adding a keyboard tray to an existing workstation, try to get one with both height and tilt adjustments. It's also a good idea to get adjustments just because you never know who will be using that workstation in the future or if that person needs to relocate to another desk or work site. A couple things to consider is that a keyboard tray will push you a little bit further away from your monitor and also increase the reach to your desk. When we think about ergonomic keyboards, most generally 
they try to change the angle or shape of the keyboard or the placement, pressure, and travel of the keys. When we look at the keyboard angle and shape, with a standard keyboard, we tend to be in pronation while we're typing on the picture on the right. Ideally, we would like to have a more neutral position as the one shown on the left. Also, as I mentioned before, with a positive keyboard tilt, we tend to get in wrist extension while we're typing. If you hold your hands out in front of you as though you were typing with no keyboard, your fingers actually cup underneath a little bit. They're not flat on the horizon. Therefore, every time that we type, our fingers are actually in extension. Another problem with a standard keyboard is we tend to be in ulnar deviation simply because we have a flat keyboard and it's put toward the center of our body. So as the picture on the left shows, you increase the angle between your hand and your forearm. Ideally, we would want to be like the picture on the right where there is no angle between our hand and forearm. Another option that ergonomic keyboards provide is different key placement. It can be in terms of frequency of use by putting the easiest keys to reach closest to one another. It can balance the amount of work and effort that we do between the left and right hand. Some ergonomic keyboards also try to put frequently used keys with stronger muscles. Some will incorporate macros or single buttons for repetitive work. Reducing finger reach is usually another goal for ergonomic keyboards. And lastly, reducing the key pressure and or travel. There are a number of ergonomic keyboards on the market. Some of them are listed here, so let's take a look at them. Let's start with the QWERTY and the Dvorak keyboards. The QWERTY keyboard is the keyboard that you're familiar with. It spells Q-W-E-R-T-Y in the upper row. The QWERTY keyboard was invented in 1872 to keep type bars from hitting each other and getting stuck while the typists were typing. The home row keys are accessed 32% of the time and the left hand does 66% of the work. They estimate that your fingers would travel 18 miles per day and the home row contains 100 of the most common words. Dvorak invented a keyboard in 1932 by studying the English language. And with his keyboard, by changing the layout of the keys, the home row is now accessed 70% of the time. Both hands do comparable work. The same type of hands would travel 2 miles per day around the keyboard instead of 18. And there are 400 of the most common words found in the home row. Additionally, it's claimed that the Dvorak keyboard is faster to learn to type with. And here's the layout for the Dvorak keyboard. The Maltron is a single keyboard you notice the bowl shape for the hands and you also notice the thumbs have the enter key and a lot of the navigation keys. The kinesis offers sort of the same shape, the bowl shape with some of the more common keys used with the thumbs instead of the little finger. The gold touch keyboard is a split keyboard and that split can be adjusted so you can make it as flat or as angular as you wish. The comfort keyboard is a little bit more radical. You can change the left and right hand to have different angles. You can also switch the number pad from left to right. The safety type keyboard gets rid of the pronation problem and they added these little mirrors on the side. The user can see the keys as they're using it to type. The data hand and the back keyboards are generally considered one-handed keyboards. All the keys are available on the data hand. It's different switches in different ways. So your index finger would have essentially five switches, either down, up, left, right, or into the device itself. And every other key is the same. The bat is a cording keyboard. So it's much like playing a piano where you hold different keys down at the same time to get a particular letter. And believe it or not, the back keyboard, you can use all the letters of the alphabet, the numbers, as well as the navigation keys. And that comes in both left and right-handed. 
The Orbit Touch keyboard completely eliminates the use of your fingers by gliding each set. The left hand selects a color and the right hand selects a corresponding letter or number that coordinates with the color. So there are a lot of various ergonomic keyboards on the market and there are many that I didn't show. So why do people tend not to use an ergonomic keyboard? Basically because they feel different, they look different, there's a learning curve associated with them. Once you start scrambling the letters or just changing the layout, it takes a while for users to get used to the new layout. If you're using multiple machines, it's difficult to have one keyboard for each machine, particularly if they're not all your computers. The other problem with that is some of these keyboards can be pretty expensive. So if you're working on two or three different computers on a regular basis, just buying a keyboard can add up. If other people use the same workstation, a lot of times people would just rather share the standard keyboard than to get something different. And because some of the keyboards have different shapes, they don't always fit well underneath a desk when you're using a keyboard tray. If you're using one and it works, why change? Those are a lot of the reasons that I get. Let's take a look at wrist rests. When we think about wrist rests, we should really consider them palm rests, not wrist rests. The carpal tunnel is a very tender area of the body and it doesn't have a lot of protection. So resting your wrist on anything is a poor idea while typing. It's recommended that when you're typing you do not rest your hands at all. Instead you type and perform a rest type cycle. And if you do need to rest, you should rest on the palm of your hand, not the wrist. They do make edge guards for areas where a person is using a a keyboard on a very sharp edge desk to help reduce the contact stress with the side of the desk. Again, don't rest while you're typing. Do a type rest cycle. Document holders are another area to address. You want to avoid putting documents flat on the desk. You notice that this person needs to turn his neck considerably to look down it also takes time to refocus your gauge from the paper to the monitor. Even having it off the desk, if it's not in line, if it's not in the same plane as the monitor, still requires a person to swivel their head and refocus their eye movements. So you want to avoid that if possible. Instead, you want to try to get the information that you want to copy or refer to on the same plane as the monitor or use it in line between the keyboard and the monitor. Another thing that's recommended is that you place documents to the side of the dominant eye to figure out which eye is dominant. Take your finger or your thumb and hold it straight out in front of you and look through your thumb to a distant object with both eyes open. Then close one eye. If your finger stays right where you were looking, that's your dominant eye. If your finger seems to jump from that target, then that is your non-dominant eye. When considering document holders, consider both the size and the weight of the information you want to display. It might be a heavy book, it might be a big spreadsheet, or you might have to consider holding multiple sheets of paper. So your document holder should be able to accommodate those needs. Also, consider several document holders. Maybe one for reference, another one to hold books, and another one to hold paper copies. When considering where to place the pointing device, you want to make sure that it's on the same surface as the keyboard. You never want to place your device above or on a different surface than where you're keyboarding. Keep the mouse or trackball as close to the keyboard as possible. In this example, you would want to move the mouse down in this area. So maybe using a compact keyboard would be a better option. Be aware that you want to keep the elbows in close to the body, not in this example where the elbows are extended away from the body. Also look for ulna deviation when using a pointing device. If a person is able to use a mouse with the left hand, this will allow the number keys to stay on the right side 
and also keep the B lined up with the belly button. A compact keyboard will also provide more space for a pointer on the right side of the keyboard by removing the navigation and number keys. A left-handed keyboard will allow you to place the mouse on the right side and a left-handed keyboard puts the number keys and the navigation keys on the left side. Keyboard shortcuts can be a great time saver. They reduce the number of times you have to move your hands from the keyboard to the mouse and can save a lot of time in traveling the mouse maybe from the bottom of the screen to the top. Some people find trackballs to be more accurate and useful than a mouse. There are foot controlled options for the mouse. Mouse keys, which is built into the Windows operating system, can eliminate problem with space needed for a pointer. Using a mouse bridge is another option. And the roller mouse also is an option. And we'll take a look at these here. If you're using a laptop or if your keyboard comes with a built-in touchpad or touch point, that could eliminate the need to make space for a mouse. The top is a left-handed keyboard. You notice the everything is just moved to the left side. This allows you to keep your B aligned with your belly button and still allows you to have room on the right side for your mouse. The compact keyboard, although it does have the navigation keys here on the side and the number keys you share at the top, it does eliminate all that space to the right side of the keyboard which gives you extra space to use the pointing device. Here's an example of a trackball, a touchpad, and a mouse bridge. A mouse bridge is just a piece of plastic that covers the number pad. The roller mouse is operated with the thumb. This little bar both rotates around and moves left and right to control the mouse and your mouse clicks and buttons are located down here in the thumb area. This way your hand never has to leave the vicinity of the keyboard and you don't have to mount something to the left or right. This just shows a close-up of the buttons on the roller mouse. There are no hands mice and foot controlled switches as well as a foot mouse that allows you to control the switch and the movement of the mouse with your feet instead of your hands. There are a number of ergonomic mice on the market. Here are a few. You notice that they all try to eliminate or reduce the pronation, give you a nice wide area to grab, and a lot of them reduce the effort that is required to push the buttons as well. So when you use a mouse, you want to control the mouse with your elbow and not your wrist. You want to avoid flicking the mouse. You also want to avoid a tight grip. Use the mouse wheel if possible. This reduces the amount of time you have to travel around the screen with your arm. And it also reduces the amount of constant pressure that you need to apply to the mouse. Again, you want to be careful about using wrist rests when you're using a mouse. It can double the carpal tunnel pressure. They can be helpful to bridge the gap of an area where the level changes slightly due to the different design of the pointing device. So we all use laptops, but there are a lot of ergonomic problems with the laptop. For any laptop, either the monitor is going to be too low or the keyboard is going to be too high for a touch typist. Generally speaking, you want the top of your monitor to be just below eye level and to do that with a laptop will require the keys to be raised too high. Likewise, if the keys are in the proper position, the monitor is going to be too low. The monitors on a laptop are often smaller than what you can get on a desktop. Sometimes that can produce more eye fatigue and make it more difficult to see the screen. The keyboard has no adjustments. The keys are generally a standard QWERTY keyboard and they're flat. Touch pads and finger joysticks have been studied and they tend to decrease the productivity up to 30% as compared to a standard mouse. If you use a tilt stand with your laptop, you automatically put the keyboard in a positive tilt and you also increase the wrist or finger extension that's required to operate the keyboard. You can add an external keyboard 
One of the problems that this poses is that it moves the monitor further away. And again, because the monitors are generally smaller, sometimes this can be a bit of an issue. In general, when you use a laptop, you want to place it on a surface, not in your lap. The keys travel less, so therefore, if you're used to using a desktop style keyboard, you want to avoid pounding the keys. Since the monitor is going to be lower than optimally recommended, you want to get in the habit of tucking your chin instead of tilting your head. Laptops are used in a multitude of different environments, which is going to introduce glare. If you're going to add devices to your system, such as keyboards, mouse, and monitors, extra power supplies, and those things, beware of the system weight because your five or six pound keyboard is going to greatly increase in weight that you need to carry around as you add all these other devices to it. Let's take a look at noise, particularly office noise. Noise or sound can either improve or degrade performance. In some instances, it can improve performance by increasing the arousal on simple and routine tasks or by masking distracting noises in the background. Noise can also degrade performance when doing complex mental activities, such as the interpretation of information. Semantic processing and short-term memory, such as proofreading, would be one example where noise would generally tend to degrade performance. It's interesting to note that auditory damage can occur before noise levels degrade performance, with the exception of verbal comprehension. Now, you probably won't run into that in an office setting. However, sometimes there are areas near a manufacturing plant, for example, that may have a lot of noise going on in the background, so it's something to be aware of. Another interesting factor about noise is that disturbance due to office noise is almost independent of measured noise levels. So in other words, just because it's very noisy, it doesn't necessarily mean that performance is going to be degraded. And it doesn't necessarily mean that performance will actually be better in a completely quiet environment. Some of the most disturbing noises is talking and conversations, simply because we tend to follow those conversations and then that gives us a dual track to what we're supposed to be doing versus what we're listening to someone else speak. And again, a noisy office may not actually be disturbing as all that noise melds together. It can just kind of drop into the background. And yet a relatively quiet office can be very disruptive because every little sound that comes up can grab our attention. And this is particularly true for cognitive disabilities. Many do accommodate to familiar noises, and we've probably all experienced that when we sleep in a new place. It might take a couple of days to acclimate to it, but eventually you do sleep well. Also, by putting a fan or a constant noise in the background, you do accommodate to that noise, and eventually you tend not to really notice it. Some people, however, don't adapt to noise as well at all. They may even become more sensitive as the day goes on. And this is particularly true with cognitive impairments where that person can easily be distracted by external noises. Another thing about noise is that it increases fatigue. And the reason it does that is because there's so much more processing that needs to go on to filter out what's important, what's not important, and to keep those outside influences at bay while we're trying to concentrate on the task at hand. Let's take a look at the work envelope. And the work envelope is simply the region of space in which a person can comfortably work. Note that it's an arc of reach. It's not a rectangle or a square. And in general, you want to put the most common tasks closest to the individual. Consider what their dominant hand might be. So for example, if a person is using a phone, they would probably want to use the phone with their opposite hand so that they can also perform writing tasks while they're on the phone. Now if they're using a headset that may not be true but if, they're, if they need to hold a receiver then that's something to consider. If their phone is on the same side as their 
dominant hand and they have a long enough cord that can reach to their non-dominant hand the only problem that you might run into is that the cord will cover some of their workspace that would otherwise be available to them when we think about the work envelope th think about it in a three-dimensional space so include several working height surfaces so for example when we do keyboarding and mousing we want the keyboard and mouse on the same surface but that height won't be the same as when we want to write or read information out of a book. So when viewing documents, viewing a monitor, these things will be all be in a different three-dimensional space. Also consider where you're going to place your task lights. You don't want to cause excessive glare either from the light or from it shining on other surfaces. So when we think about the work envelope obviously we want to maximize our space and the simplest way to do that is simply to reduce the clutter it is not at all uncommon to have people with for example a traumatic brain injury that tend to keep a very cluttered workspace and that definitely decreases efficiency and can make a given task more difficult to do also think about maximizing space in a physical sense such as using articulating arms for lights to put the light where you need it to go document holders book holders monitors keyboards are all examples of things where you can use some sort of an articulating arm to increase or change the space another example is rotating platforms or lazy susans in this example we have a rotating carousel this is a quad desk and this can be rotated around so that the user can see a number of different documents or reference material in the same location. Also consider adjustable work services. Some people do use a sit-stand workstation so that part of their day they can sit comfortably in front but then they may want to elevate that so that they can stand as well and do their work that drastically changes the posture and the work surface should accommodate that if that's something that they're using that's also true if you have a wheelchair user using the same space that a non wheelchair user uses then the adjustable work surface is generally a necessity also think about maximizing the visual workspace something to consider is your reference material reference material doesn't necessarily have to be right by the monitor you could increase the size and put it further away so that it's easy to see but out of the immediate space if you're a person that uses keyboard shortcuts and you still need to refer to the keyboard shortcuts and look at the keyboard because you don't have the motor patterns yet it might be nice to put those keyboard shortcuts very near the keyboard so that they're easy to reference and obviously if we make our reference material electronic we can put them in a file and then we can split the screen to do the reference or we can use dual monitors so we can use one monitor as the reference monitor while we use our other monitor for the work area so we're gonna cover questions in an upcoming date but other than that I would just like to say thank you and if you do have questions, we can cover those at a later time. So thank you.